What is up, everyone? Brandon First, aka First Report, representing the First Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. It is time for another edition of In the Paint. We break down everything men's basketball has or college basketball has to offer. And of course, when I say we, I mean myself and my co-host. We'll start with Raider Jim Martinez. You can find Mr. Martinez at Raider Jim 1090 on Twitter. How you doing tonight, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. How's everybody out there? The rain stopped. Uh, things are starting to dry out. And uh, if anybody's interested, I found, you know, most of the potholes in La Mesa. So yeah, just when you have a, a yeah, just when you have a map of uh, avoiding those potholes, uh, rainstorm comes through and kind of relays down those landmines. But uh, oh, it's tough on the suspension and tires. But as always, we also have Coach Brandon Lupi, and you can find Coach at Portland 76. Sir, how you doing tonight, sir? Uh, just doing well. Just uh, looking forward to another episode with you two guys. And um, Raider Jim, I'll take care. Of, I'll take that a copy of that map since uh, I like to hang out in La Mesa from time to time, and I definitely don't want any uh, surprises or interruptions in my drive. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rough out there. Hopefully everyone stays safe, um, you know, uh, on the roads and obviously up in Northern California as well. Uh, they've been hit pretty hard, but it is, of course, time to break down the week that was, and it was a pretty wild week, especially Saturday where we saw pretty much every um, ranked team or at least a high majority of them go down um, to mainly unranked teams as well some very interesting ones as we've done over the past few weeks we're going to get started with the quote-unquote team of the week uh, this is an interesting one only because uh, there's a lot to choose from if we're being honest um, but we'll start with Rutgers number 23 13 and 5 overall uh, 5 and 10 5 and 2 in Big Ten play Got a few nice wins, uh, defeated Northwestern um, on the road and, of course, Ohio State at home. They not only have been had a great season so far, but I, I you know, I was doing research on records. I saw that currently they are number four in the recruit rankings. And look, I know it's really early um, and stuff like that, but you don't necessarily think of Rutgers as a school that's going to be that high at any point in the recruiting stage. Um, so very, uh, very nice to see Rutgers uh, not only performing on the court, but looking like they're building for the future as well. Uh, we also have the College of Charleston. This is a team that's won 18 in a row. They're 19 and one overall, and, and their only loss uh, was at UNC, uh, 102 to 86, and a good one. That was all the way back in early November. Uh, College of Charleston working their way up the rankings, looking like a really solid, uh, you know, kind of Cinderella story. Speaking of Cinderella stories, we also have Florida Atlantic. They are at number 24. First ever appearance in that top 25. Um, they have the nice win over Florida in Florida. In November, they've won 16 in a row to get to 17 and one. Their only blemish on the season was a loss at Old Miss. Uh, and then the new number one is Houston. They've won eight in a row since that loss to Bama. Um, they're back to number one. It, it's been a very uh, nice run for Houston, who came into this season with a lot of expectations. And of course, we have number eight Xavier still undefeated in the Big East. Uh, they beat Cray uh, they beat Creighton at home and Marquette, who is also nationally ranked. They were close games, only seven points, but that uh, I think is really nice to see in a very tough conference for Xavier to go out and really perform well in crunch time. But Raider Jim, we'll start with you. Uh, team of the week, uh, any of those five or any others you want to give a shout out to as well. Well, yeah, when you look at the Big Ten, you know, you usually don't say, okay, if you just throw it out there, I want your first response. Big Ten basketball, not everybody screaming at Rutgers. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to start looking like maybe that uh, it's starting to look like that is going to be right on the tip of everybody's tongue if they continue to play that they are. I mean, they're they're up over Michigan right now, Illinois, Wisconsin, all the big boys. They will get tested tomorrow because, again, even though it is not – the Michigan State that we usually see every spring, every winter and fall, uh, it is Michigan State. And uh, Izzo is, is not a real happy guy right now. So if he's not going to run away with the conference, 
then his next mode of operation is going to be to let's see who we can pick off that's in front of us and and let's make our you know we've got to make ourselves seen and known and recognized in conference play so that's going to be a good one uh college of charleston fau hey you know i'm just waiting to see if they continue to have these runs then what kind of respect will they or won't they get come selection Sunday? Because you know that that's what they're going to be up against. Everybody's going to look at the resume. Everybody's going to look at, uh, at what the schedules were and say, yeah, but look who they're playing. And uh, I, I really don't appreciate that because, hey, then why aren't they getting beat? Mm -hmm. If the competition is that weak, then why aren't they getting beat? It's because they're that good. Uh, just kind of like when Loyola of Chicago had their run a couple of years back. Hey, they, they were they were uh, competitive. College of Charleston has there's two kids out there, Ante uh, Brzovic and Dante Bolin, good kids. Elijah Martin on FAU and the other guard Janelle Davis hold their own out there. Uh, so I'm I'm always for the underdog and for the uh, the little guy, you know, the 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 lions who are out there that have to take on Samson week in and week out. And what do you say about Houston? They're playing as well as we thought they would. Xavier, they're holding tough. They've uh, played very, very well. And the only other two teams I would add to that is uh, Kansas State, yeah. who are really on. The stock is going up. And what about UConn? That's the stock whose value is dropping. Uh, wow, UConn, what a, a sudden change of events over there for that program. Yeah, it's been a, a very interesting time um, there. And I think there's a lot of people going back to the Rutgers and, you know, not being the first thought um, when you say Big Ten basketball. I wouldn't be surprised if there are still a good amount of college basketball fans that don't aren't even really aware uh, that Rutgers is in the Big Ten. I they may agree. still think they're in the Big East or something like that. Obviously, this year that is changing. But coach, what are your thoughts on uh, the teams of the week? No, I really, uh, I really like what Raider Jim had to say about FAU and College of Charleston. You know, these are two um, mid-major teams that are making waves with their record, with their play. And it's, it's uh, I, I think as we've all mentioned throughout the, the past number of podcasts, the parity that's going along in NCAA basketball right now, um, you're not, like, we can't take these teams by surprise. You know, and um, I think the big boys are, are realizing it. And, you know, when it comes to that tournament time and teams are starting to talk dancing, I bet you there's a lot of head coaches across America that are going to be like, I hope they're not in my bracket. Or let's hope they're not in my pod. Let's hope that they're not in my region. Um, based on, you know, not knowing who they really are, not knowing – certain tendencies, not knowing, you know, um, strengths and weaknesses, because you can only pick so much of that stuff up on video or, or with uh, stats and whatnot. And um, they're, they definitely won't be the first team that I'd circle to want to face, uh, especially when it's that single elimination do or die moment uh, in the dance. So, I really, I really like those two teams, and I'm really happy for their success and wish them uh, continued success moving forward. Um, let's just hope teams like this don't hit a wall, because as records start to speak for themselves, um, teams in their conference get some familiarity with those kind of things that I mentioned before: strengths and weaknesses. Um, who's the who's the hot hand on the team? Certain tendencies. And, um, you know, as well as they're doing now, a simple mistake for these mid-majors in, in their conference tournament could really be detrimental to a seed or where they're placed. So I, I really like these two for the week. And, you know, I can't, I can't agree with you more in regards to Rutgers and where they are in the Big Ten. Yeah, I know they're there, but they're not a team that immediately screams Big Ten basketball. Um, let's not forget, they're on the East Coast in New Jersey where a number of players, very good, talented players, spread out across America. And Rutgers that isn't necessarily their first option or choice to stay at home and play basketball at. So for what they're doing, um, 
and what they're doing in a really strong major Power Five basketball conference is is uh, r- r- remarkable, and and they're kind of just uh, continuing to feed off what they did last year. I believe Ron Harper Jr. played with them last year and had some success, and uh, it seems to be continuing uh, into this. 2023 season so best of luck to them as well yeah it's uh for me it records definitely jumps out and obviously what kansas state did last night um was was very impressive uh especially kind of you know i'm sure they they don't like to hear it but it is the big brother little brother syndrome you know for right. better or worse it's you know look it's there aren't too many teams that can you know go head to head with kansas um year in and year out and 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 be and not be considered the little brother in that relationship but they were able to get the job done and um you know step in a definitely the right direction but i think it also kind of speaks to what we're seeing this year and uh, Coach, you brought it up before we went on, um, but the parody of things, the, the, and maybe more of the Kansas States and the Rutgers, the teams that maybe aren't the first thought, um, really coming around uh, a- and becoming the powers and able to stand up to the likes of the Michigans and the Illinois and the Kansases and uh, the Texases, which is. Uh, kind of the segue into our next topic. If I can throw one one more thing about the Big Ten basketball, if I may. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you look at Big Ten right now, you look at the number three team in the nation, the Purdue Boilermakers. They've got one loss on their uh, schedule right now, and that loss was uh, handed to them by Rutgers. Yep. So, I mean, this, this is going to be wild and woolly in the Big Ten and probably in the rest of NCAA basketball. We didn't, you know, for weeks, uh, we were pretty hot on, or one of our hot commodities was uh, Arizona. Yeah. We didn't even mention Arizona this week. Right. And, and they're down now to, you know, they're, they're going to be out of the top 10 for sure. So, wow. Yeah, it's been a it's been a crazy weekend. It, it was, uh, you know, upset Saturday, if you Dude. will. Um, it, for those and, uh, you know, what, what more can you say? And you definitely for my, um, for Florida Atlantic and, and college of Charleston, it's gotta be tough for them as well. Not a whole lot of big schools want to take the risk of playing a good team. Um, you know, like college of Charleston or Florida Atlantic, a lot of teams look at it as a no win situation. You have to win by 20 for anyone to care. And, uh, I think this team is, or these teams are probably good enough to beat plenty of power five schools. And uh, as was brought up earlier, I don't think anyone wants to see them um, on their side of the bracket come selection Sunday. But at the same time, they kind of do walk that tightrope, right? That one loss to a Northeastern or a, or a, um, you know, Florida International. And all of a sudden, here they come, you know, oh, well, that's the worst loss of the turn, you know, of anyone in, blah, blah, blah. And then you wonder if they lose three or four games, do they have to win their conference tournament? Are they good enough to be have the resume to be a quote unquote at large team. Um, Obviously they don't want to get to that point. They want to be able to win their conference tournament or, you know, be like a 30 and one team where no matter what they're in, uh, but we shall see how highly they are seated. But moving on to uh, the Texas Longhorns and this news came out uh, about a week or two ago. Um, the the kind of final resolution in the Chris Beard saga, he has officially been um, fired or removed from his position of head basketball head coach. Rodney Terry will step in for the rest of the year on an interim basis, and we'll see how that goes um, going forward. But this is, of course, Chris Beard, who just four or five years ago was taking Texas Tech to new heights, uh, maybe, you know, uh, unceremoniously left to the the big brother being Texas. And unfortunately, this has all come down. This is stemming from the domestic um, uh, violence charge that does come out. Now, I will say it was um, kind of odd timing because it came on the heels of uh, Chris Beard's wife, who pretty much came out and said no. Uh, it was self-defense and pretty much came to his defense um, and at the end of the day, uh, Texas has taken their 
uh, decision to remove Chris Beard uh, and move on from the situation. But Raider Jim, what are your thoughts overall on the situation? And really for a team that, well, they're right in the middle of the top 25. I think they're at 15. Uh, they did, I think, lose to Iowa State um, last time out. But still, this is a team that feels they could compete um, in a wide open Big 12 and a wide open uh, national you know, picture overall. But what are your thoughts going forward for the Texas Longhorn program? I think Beard may eventually return in a in an administrative level, maybe a recruiting level, but it's going to have to be some time before. If I was a director or a commissioner, it would be a long time before I would want him associated with my program or my conference because I'm sorry, but domestic violence, whether it was self-defense or not, that was a headline. And a lot of people don't read the details or don't even care what the details are. Uh, you know, it's it's the old thing. When I used to teach martial arts, the, the, the first lesson to the, to the beginners was this, your best defense, walk away. I'm gonna teach you to do stuff if you really can't walk away, but you should always make walk away from a situation. Uh, and, and domestic violence, this is a whole different thing, I, I, and I know it's not apples to apples, but when you've got the, uh, you know, the movie moguls that are on trial, when you've got uh, the former presidents on trial for sexual assault, you know, or claims of sexual assault, you can't have this type of thing associated with your program. You just can't. Uh, I don't want that guy walking into my living room shaking you know, looking up my wife, shaking my son's hand, and I've got a daughter sitting there and, and think, oh, wait a minute, do I really want them to be associated with that type of a, uh, you know, it's a stigma that's going to be with him for quite a while. So it's going to come down to um, the, the ethics of the programs that consider him, uh, where their morality clauses lie and how well they, uh, how well they enforce them, because we also see people make exceptions. You know, somebody's always going to make an exception somewhere along the line, but I think he's uh, he's in for a, a long road back. Yeah, it's. I think you you kind of hit the nail on the head with the recruiting, right? Um, you know, to to be able to look a a family or you know a parent in the eye and essentially say, yeah, I'll teach him how to be a man. Um, and with this kind of uh, cloud over your head at the same time, that that's got to, that's got to definitely uh, factor into the decision. Um, and, and Chris Beard, I, I would expect in three or four years, some school it's is going to take a chance on him. I, right. I just think they will. I don't know if it'll be a power five. It might need to be kind of the, the Hugh freeze situation. And I don't remember what the Hugh freeze situation was, but in terms of, you know, being a kind of a top commodity and then kind of having to leave football for a few years and go to Liberty, which is fine. No disrespect to Liberty, but it's not the sec level he was normally at. So we might need to see that. Um, from Chris Beard and obviously look uh, the, the road back will be a very long one for him regardless uh, you know on well, even even the coach the from uh, excuse me the coach from USD he had that program turned around heading yeah. in the right direction and all of a sudden it blows up and I know it was slightly different circumstances but where is he now yeah now you don't hear about him uh, and that could be a personal choice or it could be you know, somebody from the NCAA reached out to him and said, we're going to mutually agree that for a while you're going to take a hiatus. Yeah. The blacklist, if you will. But coach, what are your thoughts uh, on the Chris Beard situation and, and, and Texas basketball going forward? I think you guys brought up some very, very valid and, and interesting points. Um, I, I mentioned last week, the change with the president in the NCAA is, is probably going to have some some pretty good things on his agenda moving forward in regards to, you know, suspended coaches and NILs and all this type of stuff. So we're going to see in what direction this guy really wants to um, rule his hand over the NCAAs. Um, but, you know, you guys made some great observations, some very valid points. And, and honestly, Domestic violence, yeah, it's a whole other animal. But when you guys, when you got guys like Calvin Sampson and Sean Miller and Bill Self and all these guys that have violated certain uh, items under the NCAA umbrella, you wonder, you know, 
do they wait longer than than they probably should as far as their morality and their ethics and and the way it, uh, boosters kind of rule athletic departments i think this guy's going to get a job sooner than later until we hear otherwise as far as maybe he had to sign a no uh, uh, um, non compete clause or or whatever you know as, as far as texas goes because for the kids themselves, I think Texas just wanted to just, you know, shake off the dirt that came with this guy and, and move forward in a direction that best suits the team and the university. And and at, if it wasn't a guy like Rodney Terry, who has coached at a Division One head coaching level uh, at Fresno State, maybe the decision wouldn't have been so easy to let him go, you know, if if he had an experienced assistant coach on his bench instead of a guy that has had some, especially D1 experience. I, 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 I hate to hear the story of domestic violence. I think it's horrible and it's deplorable. But as you hear more and more about the story, you read more and more about the story, this isn't the first dust up between the two. This isn't the first... Um, Oh, I want to take it back and 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 clear his name or clear her name or claim self defense. You know, these two they really have a lot of personal growth to accomplish and and relationship growth they have to accomplish and maybe that's the determining factor whether this guy gets a job or not. But like you mentioned, he brought Texas Tech to a final and a final wow. four. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a long story program and your boosters want to pump in mon- money into, let's just, let's just forget about men's basketball, let's have a, an entire athletic department for itself, you know, that's a, that's a hot name. That's a commodity name that, you know, as recruiters go, you swing this negative into a positive and, and all of a sudden, I'm in the right situation with my counseling or in these domestic classes, and I'm learning to grow. You know, these guys, they get recruits, and they're very persuasive. Uh, and I'm not saying he's right, you know, in, in doing so. But, you know, when when you got boosters that are pumping money into the department, they have a lot of sway, and that could be – a determining factor moving forward if he does pursue life as a Division One coach again. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's it's an ugly situation. It's an ugly topic to talk about, and it's a mess that they both have to fix. Um, him and his estranged wife or girlfriend or fiancé, whomever she is. But um, I, I think, you know, as programs go and as – boosters go and as recruits go and as transfer portals and NILs make certain programs dip and fall or rise and accomplish that, you know, you, we may normally not see. Um, how can you ignore a guy's coaching ability, um, especially if he's getting the help that uh, he and they need to become better humans? So it's a tough situation. It's a tough topic, but He's a really good coach, and he's young, and his track record speaks for his resume. You know, doing what he did at Troy State, doing what he did at Texas Tech, doing what he was continuing to do at Texas um, into this situation. So, you know, I, I don't condone it. I, no one should, and and I think there's a number of coaches that have violated enough i'm not going to say worse um but have violated enough that have gotten jobs priced sooner than they should have yeah he he's going to get a chance he's too good um you know someone's going to take that 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 opportunity but it, it's going to have to take a little while i think uh the the smoke has to clear uh we got to kind of remember um it, it'll kind of be a situation of where you know, if he does get hired, we'll have to kind of be like, wait, why did he get fired again? You know, um, and right now I think it's just too fresh 
Uh, and oh, it looks like we lost coach. Um, so I'm sure if he, he was finished making his point, but um, yeah, it, it, it's a tough situation um, all around. Um, but but I think the big thing is those kids at Texas, they need to just kind of put the blinders on uh, and, and move forward. So, yeah, because you again, we talk about it if it's a player in the locker room, this is a distraction. This is yeah. a huge distraction. And I remember when Mark Few uh, had the incident for DUI a few years back. Let me tell you, it was that entire the rest that entire season into the postseason where they would go on the road and the jeers and the you know re- colorful remarks that were being thrown <laughs> his way through the whole time. And he's supposed to tune that out. The team was able to tune that out, but. Uh, they shouldn't have to do that. And this would be, I think, even worse. I can't imagine the posters and things like that that would be flying around in uh, visiting, you know, when they're on the road. Yeah, we did get coach back. Uh, did you want to add anything there, coach? Wasn't sure if you uh, wanted to finish point or anything. No, no I just, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a too bad of a situation for all the parties involved, especially the, the players. Um, and yeah, you know, this is not some that I'm condoning, but it's, it's, you ask the question, will he get another job? Yeah, I believe he will probably sooner than he deserves. Like a number of other coaches have. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a doggy dog world out there. Uh, wins rule all, no matter what anyone says, um, you know, <laughs> behind the microphone, but moving on to the team reports, let's dive in. We'll give the floor to Raider Jim. He'll give us the rundown. What's going on with the Gonzaga Bulldogs and, of course, the West Coast Conference as a whole? Raider Jim, the floor is yours. Well, the Gonzaga Bulldogs turned it into the most exciting road trip that they've ever had that I can recall in a long time. Those boys really, really, really uh, stretched it out against San Francisco and Santa Clara. And then the game against BYU on the other night, it was just like, my gosh, could they do anything better? Thankfully, they turned around, went back to old form when they played Portland. It was on uh, what granted Portland is not the caliber of uh, of the San Francisco, Santa Clara, BYU. But going into that game, even my son and I, as we talked about, is like, hey, no, no guarantees they're going to cover the spread on this one. Uh, we still bet on it. And yes, they covered the spread. But I mean, they just they. Wow. Wow. But they persevered. And again, it wasn't just that they persevered. It, they didn't rely on Drew Timmy. And it was nice for Drew Timmy uh, to see all the support he got from Julian Strother, from Anton Watt, from uh, Malachi Smith. These guys really, really stepped up. And then they had that uh, nice win at home. They're finally back home. So there they are sitting atop the Mountain West right now. They're 5-0, and 16-3, and and followed right by Randy Bennett's guys, the St. Mary's Gales at 5-0 and also. They're, they're just tight at the top. Let me tell you, that is going to be some games now in the second half of conference play because I think both of their contests are going to be the second half of uh, uh, West Coast conference play. We're not doing the full player profiles, but I will tell you, there's a couple kids you really got to watch out for. I watched St. Mary's the other night. They've got a guard, uh, Aiden McCaney, I think is his name. Uh, and he shoots 42% from the three-point range. They also have this big beast in the middle, which it's going to be interesting to see when he goes head-to-head against Drew Timmy. Uh, Mitchell Saxon. Mitchell Saxon, six foot 10, 240 pounds, and I believe he's a freshman. He's doing 12 points a game, eight rebounds a game. Uh, as we already know, that's never a pushover for either team. So that's going to be one of those great heavyweight battles. BYU's hanging in there. And I dropped down the list because, again, uh, wow, USD I thought was going to be on a better track than they are right now. Uh, I don't know, though. They're still not as disappointing as the University of San Francisco who are now at one and five in conference play, 12 and nine overall. Uh, You just throw your hands up in the air with that program because we all thought that it was going to be probably a four horse race in the West Coast Conference. Gonzaga, St. Mary, or St. Mary's, BYU, and the University of San Francisco. 
And I'm sure, I know I thought San Francisco was going to give everybody a real battle. Uh, but wow. So right now, West Coast Conference is looking like it should. Uh, good games coming up and uh, stay tuned and see what Gonzaga does. See if they're going to beat the spread or not. Yeah, it's uh, the 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 West Coast Conference m- might be the best uh, it's been in a little while. Uh, and and uh, a lot of those schools really bringing it kind of uh, living up to or at least aspiring to be where Gonzaga is. And I think that's the best for the West Coast Conference. Everyone trying to take down the big zap, big bag. Big bad zags. Easy. And I did hear somebody finally say aloud on one of the broadcasts, uh, they were talking, actually, it was on the Gonzaga game. And they said, you know, if they keep playing the way they do and with the teams falling the way they are, this was on Saturday evening, I believe, they said, boy, somebody better start mentioning St. Mary's when they talk about top 25. What else do they have to do? to get into the top 25 when you look at some of these other teams. Unfortunately, I think they threw out some of the, the, the Cinderella stories that you and we all three talked about, you know, the, the FAUs and the uh, college of Charleston's and, you know, so hopefully St. Mary's, I'm sure they will get the respect they deserve before too long. Definitely. We shall see uh, going forward, still plenty of regular season and conference tournament uh, to get through and, and and get that seeding all put together on the San Diego State and Mountain West side of things. Um, it was a tough night uh, on Saturday for the Aztecs. They took their first conference loss of the season. It was at home. They lost to New Mexico in a tough one uh, and, and drops them technically. Uh, they are behind Boise State. Boise State is five and one. San Diego State is four and one in the conference. Uh, but for for San Diego State, they at the very least um, w- weren't quite able to ever get really a handle um, of the the New Mexico. It seemed like they were just fighting back every uh, every possession. They were playing catch up, and and that's not how San Diego State's going to be able to win. They need to be the one setting the tempo. They need to be the one kind of being chased rather than the shoe being on the other foot. And we saw that in a nine point victory. Uh, you did get four, 14 points from Matt Bradley. Um, Johnson also was able to pitch in with uh, seven rebounds, Bradley and five assists as well. Uh, but for the Aztecs looking forward, this is going to be an interesting week for them because while they not might not be playing the best teams, they are going to be playing at altitude and that will always complicate things. You have uh, Colorado State and Air Force on deck this week, two of the teams at the bottom of the conference. But once again, you know, Fort Collins and Colorado Springs, um, you know, pretty much up there with Denver in terms of that altitude. So something you always have to deal with. We always talk about the uh, travel as well. I don't know this for sure, but I have to imagine San Diego State's probably going to spend some time in Colorado. No point in um, taking, taking on Colorado State and then flying back here and then two days later flying back out um i mean they're 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 going to be landing in denver regardless so you might as well stay and enjoy uh uh, the beautiful um out the greater denver area if you will but that that's how san diego state's looking they're still looking okay um i do believe they fell out of the top 25 which you kind of would expect with that loss to new mexico um, but as I said, Colorado State Air Force up next. Definitely want to keep an eye on that um, January 25th game. They will host Utah State. Utah State, one of the better teams in the conference. Um, as I said, Boise at the top at 15 and four. Nevada has been very impressive at five and two, um, 15 and five overall. New Mexico obviously still doing what they need to do. Uh, and, and I will give Air Force some. Um, love at three and three they really had a tough start to the season they've kind of figured it out but they have a big test against San Diego State this week but coach uh, anything you'd like to add to the San Diego State Mountain West uh, report oh you're uh, muted sorry about that yeah you know real disappointing loss on Saturday as as I was boasting and bragging how a bunch of frauds Patino and his New Mexico team were after they lost at home to uh, after they lost to Fresno State, and then they go out and they just out toughed a pretty tough San Diego State team, you know. And then you wonder why a guy like a Guapa Rope isn't playing. I didn't know he he uh, injured his his growing and warmups, and he's one of those 
garbage guys that is tough and does the little things that that um if you're not a, a basketball eye you don't really realize he does all this garbage work and he does he locks down um tough inside offensive scoring guys and you know i think his presence was a a bad loss or the lack of his presence was was bad and in contributing to a loss but the other thing what a horrible free throw night that the guys had and normally you know they're not a strong free throw shooting team but they're not as poor as it was during that night either and and when you miss free throws and and you're missing free throws after a technical like I, you you wonder what's going on in your guys in their heads and just kind of like take it for granted you know what their position was in in the standings and in the rankings and then reality check so i hope i hope it's a good reality check moving forward for them going into uh the conference tournament or the second half of conference play and uh, we'll see how they rebound moving forward from here but uh, what a disappointment Saturday was, and you know, yeah, I guess at that point you could only look up, and if you're going for a certain direction. So let's hope they get it started with Colorado State and and uh, turn a corner and kind of decide, you know what, guys, we got to play every game with a certain bravado and a certain style and a certain, you know. Um, sense of urgency and and not let games like that slip through the cracks and and put us in a tougher position later on in the season so we'll see and um we'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes you you brought up the missed free throws uh look if any team out there is um not really built to miss free throws at san diego state they need all the points they can get this is an offensively challenged team Always has been, um, and and those they're look. It's right in the name, right? Free, uh, they're free, and if you miss them, that will you know be something. We saw it last year in the tournament. Um, obviously, there were other situations, factors that went into that disappointing um, collapse. We'll call it. Uh, but the free throws will always be there at the top. And that's kind of the difference um, in big games in March is going to be your ability to knock down free throws. Uh, so hopefully San Diego state kind of shakes it off. Like you said, coach and, and gets ready to kind of run through Colorado, the Colorado schools and uh, a big game um, in a week against a very good Utah state team. So um, unfortunately when I was putting the rundown together, uh, the player spotlight slipped my mind, but that will return next week. Uh, but it is time to kind of look ahead to the top games of the week and the weekend upcoming. Uh, definitely a lot uh, of big ones. Uh, Raider Jim uh, alluded to this one earlier when referencing Rutgers. Well, they'll head to um, East Lansing to take on Michigan State. Saturday, a huge day of college basketball. Uh, you have Miami at Duke. Miami is ranked number 17. Duke is struggling, uh, but they hope to get back on track. You have UC, uh, TCU, who's number 14 in the country. They will head to Lawrence to face the Kansas Jayhawks. Of course, Kansas will really want to rebound after their loss to rival Kansas State last night. Big one in the Pac-12, where number five UCLA heads to Tucson to face number 11 Arizona and then big one in the SEC as well. You have Alabama number four at Missouri. How does Alabama kind of rebound after losing one of their players, of course, to the legal, uh, the capital murder charge, uh, you know, a lot to digest there. We'll see how they return um, against a pretty good Missouri team. Monday night, big one. You have Kansas again. This time they'll head to Waco to face number 21, Baylor. And next Tuesday, Iowa State and Kansas State. Uh, that game will be in uh, Ames, Iowa, Iowa State, number 12 in the country, Kansas State, number 13. Uh, Raider Jim, we'll start with you. What games are you looking forward to this week and weekend? Oh, certainly Rutgers, Michigan State tomorrow. But I'll tell you the other game tomorrow night that I'm going to have my eye on or my eyes on, and that is USC at Arizona. Because yeah. I'll tell you what, Arizona got knocked down twice in one round. 
And, you know, that you, sometimes you get up off the mat, you shake it off and, and you just keep fighting and everything corrects itself. But they can't look past USC because they know that the Bruins are coming to town. So take care of business tomorrow before you worry about that big TV matchup on Saturday if you're Tommy Lloyd and the boys. Uh, and the other one is, you know, Kansas. Iowa State almost took out Kansas. They came so, so close. And then they ended up dropping the game to Kansas State yesterday. Uh, they might be a little tired. They may be a little shaky too. And TCU, hey, we got nothing to lose. Let's just go out there. Let's run the floor. Let's run it hard. Let's take it to these guys and let's beat them on their own court. That's going to be a good game also. And yeah, uh, unfortunately, Alabama, great team playing so well this year and have this uh, terrible, terrible tragedy with the uh, murder charges against one of their players. Doesn't need to be a role player. It's a distraction because even though he's not a, a, a starter, he's, you know, he's one of the boys. And when one of your boys gets in trouble like that, it, these are kids and they're thinking about it. So let's see how well they keep their guys focused and in the game. Uh, best of luck to that program. And then yet yeah, Baylor, Baylor is another one that's kind of right there with Duke. What happened? I didn't expect to see Baylor out of the top 10, let alone down to number 21, uh, hanging on for dear life to stay in the top 25 ranking. So, wow. And then Tuesday, as you have noted on the schedule here, next Tuesday, if everything goes according to Hoyle for the rest of the week and weekend, wow, K-State against Iowa State, that's going to be a good one too. Definitely, definitely. Coach, what are your thoughts, uh, games this week and weekend you're looking forward to? Yeah, you know, I was really looking forward to that UCLA Arizona, hoping that, you know, they're going in playing at a high level. There's a lot of uncertainty about this Arizona team right now. And um, I would kind of love for them to overlook USC and see what happens um, if they're if they're planning on that UCLA game or game plan toward that UCLA game. You know, I, I, I said this last week. I really have had a hard time watching Big 12 basketball. The matchups that we're having, they're exceptional. And I've really got to give the Big 12 a little bit of love and, and, and watch uh, a full bracket of them. I, I have my favorites, of course. But um, I got to put those guys on the barn burner for the moment and, and watch this K-State-Iowa State team. Don't ask me what it is. I just I have a hard time. Watching Big 12 basketball, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Scott Drew messed it up for me. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. But now there's some really good matchups, and best of luck to all the teams out there. Yeah, it's going to be a really big week, and really the last few weeks we've seen some really good matchups. Uh, I agree with both of you. I think the Kansas State Iowa State matchup. Uh, may go a long way towards determining who is kind of the team behind Kansas in terms of the rankings uh, and the seating, at least. Uh, obviously, I know Kansas State defeated Kansas, but it's not a devastating loss for Kansas. I still think Kansas will get, you know, a one or a two seed and we'll see kind of which one of these other two uh, sides is out there right there with them. I think a two seed is um, very attainable for both of these programs, but this is a big game right here um, for that. Uh, and then UCLA, Arizona, obviously, um, probably the two best teams in the Pac-12 and Arizona, um, if they can get by USC kind of without overlooking them, this will be a big statement game because it, it's been a few weeks since Arizona's, you know, really had a week they can feel good about. This was a team, at least in my mind, I thought was one of the best in basketball. And now um, you, you're kind of wondering what what happened or or. You know, what is going on? Um, UCLA, a very good basketball team, very quietly up to number five in the country. Big showdown there as they head to Tucson. Uh, really, really excited for that one. Um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, of course, full disclosure, Saturday night, um, I'll be focused on the Eagles, but uh, definitely have my eye on uh, some of these matchups, um, you know, kind of off on the barn or on the back. Are you referring to the to the Marquette Eagles? Wow. And no. on that note, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I I forgot that for both of my co-hosts, football season is over um, because <laughs> neither of them made the playoffs. That was my mistake. Oh, I apologize. Uh, and, and I apologize to Coach. Coach didn't need to be pulled into the mud on that one, too, but I had to. Uh, hey, so. all good. <laughs> hey, we're all equal. <laughs> Amen. Hey, you know what? This time next week, I, we could all be in the same boat, if I'm being honest. But that's for tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, but with that, we have our now final thoughts. We'll start with you, Raider Jim. Well, I think we covered it pretty good this week. I, I'm waiting to see, are we going to get uh, the rain has cleared out in Southern California? So hopefully everything's going to calm down in NCAA men's basketball and it won't be quite as raucous as it was last weekend but uh, hope everything's close and i hope everything's exciting and i know we'll have at least one or two upsets to talk about next week definitely definitely coach what are your final thoughts for this episode of in the paint you know um i think as as we look forward into the season every week it's been about this new team or this surprise team or this quiet team you know, I can't attest to the job that Mick Cronin has done at UCLA. They finally got a head coach choice right that wasn't about name value. And I'm not a UCLA guy at all. I don't like anything to do with LA, really. But when they stole him from the University of Cincinnati, I said, shoot. This guy's going to bring a certain demeanor and a certain style and a certain toughness to this UCLA team that's going to be unmatched in the Pac-12, and he's going to be able to use those coaching strengths to pull very talented recruits. And and we're starting to see the uh, benefit of it. They're five in the country, and um, – I got to stop showing them as much love as I am, but I am a Mick Cronin fan and, and for a while have been. So, you know, thank you guys. It was a fun show and best of luck to all the teams that we're rooting for and best of luck to those quiet teams that have been making waves throughout the year. Keep it up. Amen. Yeah, it's going to be this. We're getting to it. You know, we're, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered and I don't think we're, you know, near getting all of the answers by any stretch of the imagination, but we're starting to kind of get a little bit better feel for what what's going to happen and, and how the rest of the season's going to go. But at the same time, I think we all know, um, you know, anything can and probably will happen uh, as we get closer and closer to March. And um, we'll be here for you to break it all down. And I can't wait, honestly, um, to, to really be able to dive in the February and March um, time of year where it's all about college basketball um, you know the, the the main focus at least for us here but with that thank you all so much for listening to this edition of in the paint presented by the first off the bench podcast network everyone comes off the bench we are first it is time for you all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody we'll talk to you all very soon take care and have a great week